the Albany Law Review and thank them for organizing such an outstanding event to honor one of our most distinguished graduates. I'd like to first welcome our speakers for this evening, Associate Judge Victoria Graffio, uh, Professor John Barrett, and Mr. Phil Neal, and thank them for their participation this evening. I'd also like to take a moment to honor some of our special guests, including members of the Jackson family, Justice Jackson's granddaughter, the Honorable Melissa Jackson. His grand, yes, please stand. His grandson, Mr. Thomas Loftus. Great grandson, Mr. William Hook. Which, by the way, if you get a chance to talk to him about how wonderful Albany Law School is, you might do that since he is a, a fine to law school. <laughs> Someplace. And you ought to convince him to come here. And his great grandniece, Miss Karen Ingeman. I'd also like to uh, introduce and welcome a member of Justice Jackson's Nuremberg staff who flew in from Los Angeles to be with us tonight, Mrs. Alma McLennan. I'd also like to welcome the president of the Jackson Center in Jamestown, New York, Mr. Greg Peterson. Greg Horton. And I'd like to welcome back to Albany Law School the Chief Judge of the State of New York, the Honorable Judith Kay. I would just simply like to say welcome, and it's my pleasure to turn the program over to the Executive Editor for Law Review Symposia and a member of the class of 2005. Noel Lagu Alvarez. Noel. Thank you, Dean Guernsey. I'd like to echo the Dean in welcoming you to Albany Law School. As you can imagine, this evening's event has been many months in the making. In fact, last May, Professor Barrett, our keynoter this evening, A.J. Vicky, the editor-in-chief of the Law Review, and I had dinner together in New York. And towards the end of the night, I said fairly dramatically, Professor, I have to ask you, how do you pronounce that name represented by the letter H in Robert H. Jackson? This, of course, was ironic given the spelling of my own last name. <laughs> So he sort of chuckled and sat back, and then, being a law school professor, turned the question back on us. <laughs> and despite my protest that I was in fact asking him the correct pronunciation, AJ and I took a couple of cracks at it that I won't repeat here tonight. <laughs> Finally, Professor Barrett relented and divulged the correct pronunciation. And so it was my very great pleasure to welcome you to the Robert Howitt Jackson Memorial Tribute. Hey. <laughs> in 1969, 15 years after Justice Jackson's death, the Association of the Bar of the City of New York held a series of tributes uh, that were later captured in this book entitled Mr. Justice Jackson, Four Lectures in His Honor. Whitney North Seymour wrote the general introduction to this book, and his words still ring true today, a full 50 years after Jackson's death. His sentiments, I believe, also capture what we too are trying to achieve here tonight. He wrote, for those who knew Robert Jackson, these lectures and their introductions conjure him up so that one can almost see him reading an opinion on the court or addressing a bar association or exchanging anecdotes in a intimate circle. For those who did not have the privilege of knowing him, it is hoped that these lectures will help to ensure that his contributions, career, and spirit 
will remain a part of the great tradition of comradeship of bench and bar, and of the great concepts of equal justice for all, and the rule of law, which were a part of his dream as they are of ours. Before I introduce our first speaker, there are several people that I'd like to thank. First of all, to all three of our speakers, thank you for giving of your time. Thank you to the entire Law Review keyboard. It's my pleasure to work with you. Also to all members of the Law Review, this has been a team effort, and I appreciate very much everyone who helped in planning and organizing this day. To our advisor, Professor Von Ventry, thank you for your advice and support. Thank you as well to Teresa Colbert, whose assistance has been crucial. Thank you to Dean Guernsey and Gail Benson. Thank you also to Judge the Line for your gracious guidance. Thank you to Tammy Weinman, Bob Eaton, Lori Stevens, Mike Knoyer, Holly Stewart-World and Jessica Litwin, Helen adams Keen, Beth Dawson and Elizabeth Gallagher, Jordan Smith and Alexandra Harrington, and Greg Peterson and everybody at the Jackson Center. A special thank you to AJ. We've been partners in crime on this for a long time now, and now we're gonna have to come up with something else to talk about. <laughs> also, a special thank you to my office mate, Jonathan Paul. He's the executive editor for business. No matter what happens, and no matter how stressed out I was about the budget, he remains steadfastly supportive and optimistic. Finally, on a very personal note, thank you to my parents and to my husband. Your love has made all the difference. It's now a pleasure for me to introduce our first speaker, the Honorable Victoria Graffio. There are actually some interesting parallels between the careers of Judge Graffio and Justice Jackson. First, of course, both attended Albany Law School. Judge Graffio graduated from this institution in 1977. Both also dedicated many years of their career to government service. Both Justice Jackson and Judge Graffio have served in the capacity of Solicitor General. Justice Jackson on the federal level and Judge Graffio as the New York State Solicitor General from January 1995 through September 1996. Finally, both served on high courts. Justice Jackson, of course, on the U.S. Supreme Court. And Judge Graffio is currently an associate judge on the New York State Court of Appeals. Thank you, Judge Graffio, for speaking here tonight. begin my remarks tonight in a very lighthearted manner, but for those of us in the court system, we have quite heavy hearts tonight. One of my fellow classmates at Albany Law School, Peter Porco, died tragically today. Peter was also a 1977 alum, and he was principal law clerk to the Honorable Anthony B. Cardona, another graduate of Albany Law School and presiding justice of the Appellate Division, Third Department. But more importantly, Peter was a wonderful and caring person, and I would ask you to please remember our friend and colleague Peter in your prayers. Thank you. So tonight, we will be hearing about the astonishing contributions of United States Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackson from such distinguished scholars as Dean Neal and Professor Barrett. They have spent years studying the life and work of Justice Jackson in order to, pres in order to preserve his well-earned place in American and world history. And we are delighted that they have come to Albany this evening to share their fascinating recollections and knowledge of this extraordinary jurist and lawyer. Welcome to our law school community, which for a brief time was Justice Jackson's home as well. It was an inspirational journey to spend this past summer reading about Justice Jackson. Among the most interesting of the many articles and books written by lawyers and judges who worked or who had studied Justice Jackson were Professor Barrett's fascinating compilations of Robert Jackson's memoirs of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt in That Man, and Eugene Gerhardt's comprehensive biography of Robert Jackson, which was republished last year by the Jackson Center in Jamestown, New York, 
I highly recommend both books, and I told John that I would give a plug, especially for his book, since he traveled here this evening. My presentation focuses on the years Robert Jackson spent as a government lawyer before his appointment to the United States Supreme Court. So I'll be covering the years 1934 to 1941, the years he spent in the Roosevelt administration. No study of Robert Jackson's contributions to the law and his lasting imprint on history is complete without an appreciation of his work at the United States Bureau of the Treasury and the Justice Department, where he served as U.S. Solicitor General and eventually as Attorney General during the volatile New Deal era of monumental change in American society. It was during these years that he was an influential confidant and advisor to President Franklin Roosevelt. And in his official positions, he fought to uphold New Deal legislation and programs, earning him national prominence and eventually a seat on the United States Supreme Court. As we mark the passing of a half century since his death, there are important reasons why we should keep the memory and work of Justice Jackson in the spotlight. His towering intellect and tenacity was coupled with a strong sense of personal independence and ethical conviction, attributes that remain a superb example of the highest standards we strive to emulate in the legal profession. And his achievements as a government lawyer illustrate his deep respect for the law and how it can be used as a vehicle to shape the relationship between government and its people. But we can't begin to understand Robert Jackson's motivations without some information about his background. His life represents a quintessential example of an American success story. In this respect, Jackson, I believe, had more in common with his 19th century self-educated leaders than with his contemporaries but he unquestionably possessed 20th century vision in recognizing the importance of our legal system and the role of the judiciary in the structure of American democracy. Largely self-taught, other than the year he spent at Albany Law School, he did not attend college. He was deeply influenced by the values instilled in him by his hardworking Pennsylvania farm family. The importance of perseverance an independent thought would define his entire life and probably led him to study law against his father's wishes. All his life, he was proud of being referred to as a country lawyer from Jamestown. After two decades building a prosperous litigation practice and representing a wide spectrum of individual and corporate clients, Jackson had won the respect of his community and the bar for his keen, analytical abilities and his skills as a litigator. So how did a sole practitioner from rural Western New York end up on the United States Supreme Court and as America's advocate at the Nuremberg trials, where he received accolades from around the world for his work on behalf of freedom and human rights. And he managed all of this within 10 years of leaving Jamestown. Just an incredible story. You'll hear more about Justice Jackson's life from Professor Barrett, but in order for me to explain how he came to work in Washington, I need to mention how he came to know Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and I hope I'm not intruding too much, Professor, on your remarks. But as a young lawyer, Robert Jackson was active in the reform movement in Democratic Party politics, and as a result, he became acquainted with Franklin Roosevelt when Roosevelt was a member of the New York State Legislature. After Roosevelt became Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Jackson would on occasion travel to Washington, D.C. to enlist Roosevelt's assistance in arranging meeting with meetings with federal agencies, such as the United States Post Office, that could hopefully provide some jobs for members of his parties in Western New York. So patronage was apparently alive and well at that time as well. These acts of political benevolence probably won Jackson's allegiance to Roosevelt, and their friendship would later serve Jackson well 
as Franklin Roosevelt's career soared to governor of the state of New York and president of the United States. In 1934, Jackson embarked on a major career change. Enticed by the opportunity to promote President Roosevelt's New Deal policies, he accepted a job offer from Henry Morgan now, Secretary of the U.S. Treasury, to serve as General Counsel of the Bureau of Internal Revenue, which apparently was the predecessor to what we know as the IRS. Jackson was pleasantly surprised with the high quality and genuine dedication of the lawyers that he worked with at Treasury, and his respect for attorneys in government service continued to grow over the years. I was particularly pleased to learn this about Justice Jackson and about the fact that he would frequently praise government lawyers in many of his public addresses because I too have spent the better part of my legal career in government service and have been so grateful for the talents and commitment displayed by public sector lawyers. They deserve far more credit for the work they do than they receive and my thanks to the fabulous attorneys who are here from our court, the Court of Appeals, and to the lawyers I see who are here from Appeals and Opinions from my former office at the Attorney General's <coughs> office. Although the importance of Robert Jackson's work at Treasury has been a bit overshadowed by the development of tax law in the past 50 years, he instigated significant New Deal efforts to combat corporate tax abuses. One prominent example was the tax evasion trial that he handled against Andrew Mellon, which thrust Jackson into the national spotlight. Within only two years of his arrival in Washington, Jackson had become widely recognized as one of the most talented attorneys in President Roosevelt's legal arsenal. His success at Treasury propelled Jackson to the post of Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Tax Division at the Justice Department in 1936, but within a few months, he was made head of its antitrust division. In this position, he began his association with the Supreme Court that would continue for the remainder of his life. In the year and a half that he managed the antitrust division, Jackson argued 10 cases before the U.S. Supreme Court, and interestingly, only one of those cases involved an antitrust case. Such were his recognized abilities at justice as an effective appellate advocate. His cases before the Supreme Court during this time were critical to the advancement of Roosevelt's programs, such as the establishment of the social security system and the federal regulation of public utilities. His value to the Roosevelt agenda was undeniable, and when U.S. Solicitor General Stanley Reed was nominated for the U.S. Supreme Court, President Roosevelt appointed Jackson as his successor in March of 1938. As Solicitor General for the United States, Robert Jackson cemented his reputation as a highly gifted appellate advocate, both for his analytical abilities and his masterful legal writing. Whether evaluated by Supreme Court personnel or his law clerks or members of the bar, all concurred that Jackson was one of the nation's premier oral advocates. His precision and clarity of oral presentation was admired by the justices of the Supreme Court, as evidenced by Justice Louis Brandeis's remark that Robert Jackson should remain solicitor for life. His work habits, though, were surprisingly idiosyncratic. He worked on his appeals in solitude and did not seek input from other lawyers on his staff. He believed so strongly in his own abilities that he declined to participate in moot court arguments before his appearances in the Supreme Court. Nor would he often disclose his oral argument strategy to his staff, a practice that must have caused his assistant solicitors serving as co-counsel much consternation since they had to formulate their argument strategies on their feet after hearing him present his points to the bench. Must have been great fun for them. <laughs> the responsibilities of the Office of Solicitor General are unique in the realm of government, not due solely to the extraordinary 
decision-making independence traditionally exercised by that office. But because the U.S. solicitor serves several entities, the executive branch of government, the American people, and the United States Supreme Court. Against the backdrop of legal precedent and the public policy agendas of the President and Congress, the solicitor reviews federal agency requests and third-party amici invitations in order to determine what government cases are appropriate candidates for writs of certiorari and what appeals warrant the government's participation as an amicus party. This multifaceted case evaluation process demands the tactical negotiating skills of a diplomat when dealing with cabinet members, dueling agencies, and the multitude of interest groups that seek assistance from the solicitor. It also requires legal acuity in forecasting the constitutional implications of each prospective appeal. Historians and Supreme Court scholars agree that Robert Jackson was superbly suited to this role and that he navigated the stormy waters of the New Deal with political prowess and legal insight. Above all else, Jackson was fiercely protective of the integrity and independence of his office and was able to preserve those principles while maintaining the trust of administration officials. Robert Jackson's performances as U.S. Solicitor General before the Supreme Court are legendary. He relished the art of advocacy and sought to simplify even the most complex of cases, working with precision to identify just those key concepts that would illuminate his points. Over the course of only 10 days in 1939, he argued seven appeals before the U.S. Supreme Court, an unbelievable record and an extraordinary memory, not to confuse the cases. <laughs> On other occasions, Jackson would argue two or three cases a week or perhaps in a single day. These statistics not only reflect Robert Jackson's towering intellectual capacity, but I think his physical stamina as well. Never flashy or theatrical in his presentations, Jackson captured the interest of the justices with plain good sense, mastery of the law, detailed knowledge of the factual background of his cases, and thorough analysis of the implications of a particular ruling. Same thing we look for today, right, Chief? Under any standard, he accumulated an impressive record of Supreme Court victories. Many of his successful appeals upheld landmark legislation, such as the Tobacco Inspection Act of 1935, the Agricultural Adjustment Act of 1938, and the Revenue Act of 1936. No wonder that one of his law clerks, E. Barrett Prettyman, aptly commented, if ever a job sought out the man and the man found his proper niche, it was so with Solicitor Generalship and Robert Jackson. Although I think that quote could probably be extended to the work he did after he left the Justice Department. In January 1940, as Americans watched the Nazis invade Europe, Robert Jackson was sworn in at attorney, as Attorney General of the United States. He would hold this office for only a year and a half before President Roosevelt appointed him to the Supreme Court in July of 1941. During his tenure as Attorney General, he avoided departmental organization, preferring instead to concentrate on policy development and to serve as an advisor to the President during such a critical pre-war time. One example of the importance of his role as Attorney General was an AG opinion that he issued that allowed President Roosevelt, without congressional approval, to transfer 15 naval destroyers to England in exchange for military bases in the British territories. This enhanced England's ability to combat Axis submarines before the United States entry into World War II. Despite the weighty responsibilities confronting him as Attorney General, Robert Jackson continued to handle cases before the Supreme Court. He represented the government in three cases during his tenure as Attorney General, which was highly unusual undertaking for an Attorney General. 
and he won all three arguments, including a case upholding the constitutionality of the Bituminous Coal Conservation Act of 1937. Although his service at justice ended in 1941 when he was nominated for the U.S. Supreme Court, Robert Jackson devoted the remainder of his life to the pursuit of justice and public service, not only through his work and his legacy on the Supreme Court, but in the international arena. In 1945, at the request of President Harry S. Truman, he took a leave from the court to serve as the American prosecutor of Nazi war criminals at the Nuremberg trials. His work in organizing the Nuremberg proceedings established precepts in international law that continue to govern modern international tribunals. Throughout his career, Robert Jackson maintained his close relationship to the bar and cherished the principles and traditions that he believed helped to foster the essential component of the American system of justice, competent trial lawyers. For his dedication to promoting lawyering, he was known as the judiciary's voice of the bar. The legacy of Justice Robert Jackson is many faceted. He remains an inspiration to generations of trial and appellate lawyers. His opinions and writings stand as shining examples of clarity and effectiveness in legal composition, and he embodies the noble cause of public service. We honor his contributions to the development of American law and his service to our nation on this 50th anniversary of his passing. This institution can be proud to have played a role in the life of this extraordinary American. We thank the members of the Jackson family and people from his staff who have come to Albany tonight, and thank you very much. Most significant to tonight's event, Mr. Neal was law clerk to Justice Jackson in the 1944 and 1945 Supreme Court terms. Before clerking for Justice Jackson, Mr. Neal received his AB degree, summa cum laude, from Harvard College in 1940, and his LLB degree, magna cum laude, in 1945, I mean, pardon me, 1943, from Harvard Law School, where he was president of the Harvard Law Review. Prior to the founding of Neil Gerber and Eisenberg in 1986, Mr. Neil was deeply. Mr. Chairman, distinguished guests, and may it please the court. <laughs> <coughs> I really deeply appreciate the opportunity to take part in this celebration of the life and work of Justice Jackson, and among other things, it gives me a chance to acknowledge publicly my own debt for one of the great experiences of my life. And I especially want to commend the, the editors of the Albany Law Review for taking the initiative to do this. I think it's wonderful. Albany Law School itself may, may very well take pride in the fact that Robert Jackson's legal career began here, or almost began here. The fact is he'd begun his legal career a year before when he clerked uh, part-time in the Jamestown Law Office of his cousin Frank Mott. Incidentally, he, uh, he did that uh, year at the same time that he was taking what amounted to a postgraduate year at Jamestown High School. And it was in that year that he came under the influence of Miss Mary Willard, an English teacher who uh, must have been a wonderful teacher uh, and who I think was one of the most important influences in his life. He spent only one year at Albany Law School, but, uh, but in that one year managed to complete what I understand were the two year uh, requirements for graduation. And he followed that year with another year of law office apprenticeship. So how much credit the law school can actually claim for Robert Jackson's accomplishments in the law would be uh, somewhat hard to say. But what we can say with assurance 
is that it did nothing to suppress his native ability. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe that's no small claim. <laughs> I first uh, met Justice Jackson in the winter of 1943 when I was uh, still in law school. And I, I received a letter from him inviting me to come to Washington to be interviewed uh, uh, for a possible clerkship with him. Uh, the process of selecting Supreme Court law clerks was much less elaborate in those days than it is today. Most of the justices used some law school professor or some appellate judge to recommend a law clerk to them. And uh, it's, uh, it's very different uh, today. Uh, Supreme Court law clerks almost invariably come from the ranks of Court of Appeals clerks, and it's become uh, a very complex and competitive. I'm told that uh, applicants nowadays may spend weeks preparing for an interview with a particular Supreme Court justice, uh, much like preparing for a bar exam. Well, happily for me, I never went through uh, <laughs> It happened that a classmate and, uh, and a good friend of mine was William Jackson, the justice's son. And uh, <laughs> Justice uh, Jackson, I believe, had uh, discussed the matter with Bill. Uh, so I went down and had a very enjoyable conversation with the justice and of course uh, accepted his invitation uh, on, the, on the spot. Um, many years later I had the opportunity to introduce Justice Jackson to an outstanding student of mine at Stanford Law School who I thought would make a good law clerk for him and I don't think the justice hesitated very long that time either in deciding to take the student as one of his clerks for the next term. By that time, there were, there were two. There was only one in my time. Uh, that student, by the way, was uh, William Rehnquist. <laughs> and my impression is that Justice Jackson never agonized very much over selecting a law clerk, as with so much else in his life, he acted with a sure sense of his own judgment and a willingness uh, to risk being wrong. Uh, this was also another manifestation of the self-reliance that was one of his, I think, strongest traits. And he kept uh, framed on his mantelpiece a rendering of Kipling's line, he traveled the fastest who traveled alone. The truth is that Justice Jackson didn't really need a law clerk. <laughs> Unlike uh, most other justices I've known or heard about, uh, he didn't use law clerks to write drafts of opinions. He made some revisions in drafts in response to a law clerk's comments, but nearly every word of his opinion came from his own pen. I don't think there are many you can say that about. The one exception in his practice was that once or twice during a clerkship, the justice would assign the writing of an opinion to the law clerk. I think his purpose was mainly to give the clerk that experience and to give him a sense of uh, participation in the, in the enterprise. Uh, and, and I must say the justice was as deferential to the law clerk's uh, draft as the law clerk uh, was was to his draft. I can only recall his addition of two or three phrases inserted to give the draft his distinctive imprint. And there were other ways in which he made his law clerk feel more like a junior partner than an employee or minion. If, if one were visiting in some other law clerk's office, there would often be the interruption of a buzzer which meant, uh, come here right now. Uh, if, there was a, if there was a buzzer in my office, I, I never knew it. Uh, Justice Jackson's invariable habit was to walk from his office through the secretary's office 
which was a big office, and come to my door and say, you got a minute? Now, that was characteristic of his, uh, of his whole, whole uh, attitude toward other people in life. He didn't have the slightest trace of, uh, of uh, pomposity or, or self-importance. Uh, I must say that such an easy person-to-person -person, uh, relationship with a law clerk wasn't universal in the, in the court. A, a very good friend of mine uh, who, who was clerk to a, to a justice whom I need not name, uh, and once in ten the justice that he was going to be married on a forthcoming Saturday and would appreciate it if he could have the Sunday off. And the reply was, Sonny, you're in the big leagues now. <laughs> Justice Jackson's uh, ordinary uh, working procedure was to produce a more or less finished draft of an opinion and uh, give it to the law clerk uh, with an invitation to comment. And you learned uh, pretty quickly to be as prompt as possible if you wanted to make any suggestions or comments on an opinion. And because uh, once he was pretty well satisfied uh, with his own draft, he was quite anxious to uh, get the reactions of other members of the court. So, so he would likely say, well, that's a pretty good point, uh, but let's get the draft printed up and shoot it around and uh, see what the others say. And then, of course, uh, if, as fairly often happened. He got uh, four concurrences. Uh, he would say, uh, well, let's not rock the boat now. <laughs> <laughs> his, uh, his procedure was very different with a few major cases in which his opinions went through many drafts and became the subject of a lot of interchange, uh, both uh, uh, orally and uh, in memoranda uh, with his law clerk. The, uh, the two efforts that stand out uh, most in my mind were his opinion for the court in the Anthony Kramer treason case, a, a wonderful uh, opinion. It's a great historical summary in addition to uh, other aspects of it. That case and his dissenting opinion in the Hope Natural Gas case, in which he advanced a novel theory for the regulation of gas rates, a theory that I think uh, never really took hold. The most striking aspect of his work, of course, was the extraordinary attractiveness of his prose. How he came to have such a talent is, I think, a fascinating question. Although uh, surely his year of exposure to Miss Mary Willard must account for much of his appreciation of good prose and his familiarity with English literature. I suspect that he discovered early on that he had a gift for graceful and vivid expression and used every opportunity to cultivate it. Certainly there was never anything strained or studied about his composition and the easy flow of his prose is shown by the clean handwritten drafts he produced in that uh, beautiful handwriting that seems never to have changed from his uh, early adulthood. Uh, Tom Loftus tells me that's, uh, it's genetic, I think. <laughs> Justice Jackson's uh, striking analogies, aphorisms, paradoxes, and antitheses were so much a part of all his writing that isolated examples can't convey the full impact of his writing style by any means. Uh, one simple example, he began one opinion by saying, we granted certiorari, and in this court, the parties changed positions as nimbly as if dancing a quadrille. <laughs> uh, square dancing was one of his pastimes, yeah, as was uh, horseback riding. In another opinion, speaking of bribery, he said, men are more often bribed by their loyalties and ambitions than by money. That's a characteristic aphorism. <laughs> he could be at his best when he turned his wit on himself 
as in disowning a prior position. To quote, except for any personal humiliation involved in admitting that I do not always understand the opinions of this court, <laughs> I see no reason why I should be consciously wrong today because I was unconsciously wrong yesterday. <laughs> And, and as that uh, quotation shows, he was, he was not averse to sardonic comment on the opinions of the majority. In another dissent, he said, I do not know whether it is the view of the court that a judge must be thick-skinned or just thick-headed, but nothing in my experience or observation confirms the idea that he is insensitive to publicity. <laughs> or again, the court's reasoning adds up to this. The commission must be sustained because of its accumulated experience in solving a problem which, with which it had never before been confronted. <laughs> I give up. <laughs> he was most eloquent, however, when his prose was put at the service of fundamental values. The inspirational power of his statements was comparable, it seems to me, to the wartime speeches of Winston Churchill with whom he had another number of other traits in common, I think. Memorable examples are his opinion for the court in the flag salute case, and his dissenting opinion in Korematsu, the Japanese relocation case, and of course his opening and closing addresses to the war crimes tribunal at Nuremberg, uh, which I, I must say have, have made available to anybody who is interested all the essence of the massive record of the Nazi crimes that the Nuremberg trial created. Well, I can't attempt to summarize Jack, Justice Jackson's judicial philosophy, but I, I would like to comment briefly on certain prominent themes that made a deep impression on me during my time with him. One was his constant concern for the practical consequences of decisions. This concern was brought home to me early on by his opinion in a rather routine tax case. His experience litigating tax cases for the government had convinced it that whenever the Supreme Court tried to deal with the intricacies of the tax laws, it was likely to make a mess of it. And he had asked my, my predecessor, law clerk, John Costello to prepare a memorandum on the scope of review of tax court decisions. Uh, John's memorandum produced a conclusion that the scope of review of tax court decisions was no different from that of any other uh, lower courts. And uh, John told me that, that the justice walked into his office with uh, the memorandum in hand, chuckling, and said, uh, well, John, uh, that may be the law now, but it won't be for long if I can help it. <laughs> and the opportunity came when he was assigned during my time there, a case known as Dobson against the Commissioner, in which he ruled uh, for the court that tax court opinions should be reversed only for plain error of law, sort of like an administrative agency. In another case, the majority of the court overturned a 75-year-old precedent to bring the insurance business within the authority of Congress to regulate interstate commerce. And although Justice Jackson was not by any means averse to overruling precedent when proper, he dissented in this instance because the decision he knew would have widespread effects in upsetting an established regulatory uh, scheme in the states that was built on the old assumption that insurance was not commerce. He thought it ought to be left to Congress, which could deal uh, more finely with the problem. And actually, Congress uh, confirmed his worries by promptly restoring to the states most of the authority the court's decision would have taken away. The second trait that made a deep impression on me was the value he placed on fairness as an overriding principle. He had, of course, been a confirmed uh, New Dealer and undoubtedly was strongly sympathetic with the New Deal labor legislation. But his sense of fairness took over when he confronted what he thought were overly 
zealous interpretations of those statutes. And there were a couple of uh, striking examples uh, during my time there. In one case, the Labor Board had condemned an employer for enforcing a union shop agreement that the employer had agreed to only because the Labor Board itself had encouraged the employer to accept it. And that was very offensive to him. The majority opinion, which upheld the labor law, conveniently omitted uh, that part of the factual background, a circumstance that added uh, to the indignation with which he dissented. His indignation was even greater in the famous portal to portal case in which a fair majority of the court voted to accept the definition of the work week uh, for coal miners that had been repeatedly rejected in arriving at collectively bargained bargain wage rates. Justice Dac Jackson concluded his dissenting opinion with one of his most stinging rebukes in which he said for four, four members of the court who dissented, we doubt if one can find a case in which the court has made a more extreme exertion of power or one so little supported or explained by either the statute or the record in the case. Power should answer to reason, nonetheless, because its fiat is beyond appeal. The third dominant strain in his work that I would mention was, uh, was his zeal to protect individuals from unnecessary demands of organized society, or what he thought were unnecessary demands. Well-known examples are his opinion in the flag salute case, which I referred to, and the Japanese relocation case, as well as the treason case, in which he adopted a view of the treason clause that makes prosecutions for treason uh, well nigh Im impossible. One other example that, uh, that I liked was is, uh, his opinion in the United States against Ballard, in which, uh, in which he wrote an extraordinarily perceptive <coughs> commentary on the nature of unorthodox religious beliefs. The majority was upholding a conviction for mail fraud of the promoters of a religious cult called uh, the I Am movement. And although the majority ruled that the truth or falsity of, uh, of the defendant's alleged religious experiences uh, couldn't be put to the jury. It also held that the defendants were guilty of mail fraud if, if they themselves didn't believe what they were telling their followers. And just Jackson observed that any inquiry into intellectual honesty in religion raises profound psychological problems and that it's an impossible task for juries to separate fancied experiences from real ones, dreams from happening, and hallucinations from true clairvoyance. He said, he said the price of freedom of religion or of speech or of the press is that, quote, we must put up with and even pay for a good deal of rubbish. And so he concluded, I would dismiss the indictment and have done with this business of judicially examining other people's faiths. A, a very characteristic uh, expression for him, I think. Well, the individuality of Justice Jackson's approach to legal problems was a hallmark of his judicial work, just as rugged independence was a hallmark of his character. As he liked to point out, he was probably the last Supreme Court justice there would ever be who received his legal training primarily by apprenticeship rather than formal study. And one cannot help wondering whether his style of thinking and writing about the law would have been different if he had been the product instead of intensive law review training. <laughs> of course, it's idle to speculate about that. And, 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 and it might be more useful to ask how students of today might be stimulated by his example. I've sometimes thought that one of the underdeveloped uses of the case method is its potential for cultivating good taste in legal literature. 
What a superb addition to one's legal education might be obtained from simply reading and analyzing scores of opinions by Judge Cardozo, or Learned Hand, or Henry Friendly, or Robert Jackson. And so in conclusion, I, I leave you with the thought, might not the Albany Law School do well to initiate such an experiment by offering a course or seminar devoted entirely to the opinions of Robert H. Jackson. It would be a fitting tri tribute, I think, to use his own works to provide the kind of experience that he evidently received from that splendid teacher, Mary Willard. And I'm sure it would give law students much pleasure, as I have found anew in rereading familiar opinions in preparation for this evening. That's part of the reason why I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to participate in this event. <laughs>